So um, it's 4.30. I think we'll get started. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm D uh, Daniel Ziblatt, the interim director with, uh, of this center. I'm a professor of government at Harvard. And my, uh, in my interim directorship is rapidly uh, vanishing because it's only for a couple more months until Jagor Shekhar comes back. Um, so I'm here for this semester. And one of the, the highlights of being a director is to have a director seminar uh, where we invite uh, prominent scholars to talk about important work, um, cutting edge work, or a topic of particularly contemporary relevance. And so I was very pleased. Um, one of the first things I decided I wanted to do when becoming director for the semester was to organize a, a director seminar on, on this important new book, Intimate Violence, Anti-Jewish Pogroms on the Eve of the Holocaust by Jeffrey Kopstein and Jason Wittenberg. Um, so as they'll explain, they, they ask the question, why do pogroms happen in some places and not others? And they examine this especially brutal wave of violence um, on the eastern edges of Poland, western edges of uh, Ukraine, um, 1941. Uh, but they ask a set of general questions about what gives rise to political violence. And they emerged uh, with lots of insights about this. So what, one of the things that's distinctive about this book is that it's rare to find a book that speaks so directly to both debates among historians and political scientists. And this really is right at that intersection. Um, so we've actually invited two outstanding discussants today to uh, one historian, one political scientist um, to, dis to discuss the book. So let me just qu quickly give very brief bios of each person here so you know who, who's sitting on the panel. So, so Jason Wittenberg, Associate Professor of Political Science at UC Berkeley, studies ethnic politics, st statistical methods, Eastern Europe. Uh, he's the author of many articles and, and a wonderful, his first book, Crucibles of Political Loyalty, Church Institutions and Electoral Continuity in Hungary. Um, and Jason, as a graduate student, uh, was an affiliate of the center, so knows the center well. Uh, and Jeff Kopstein uh, is professor of political science at uh, UC Irvine and also chair of the political science department at UC Irvine. And in his research focuses on inter-ethnic violence, of course, voting patterns of minority groups, anti-liberal tendencies, and generally he's an expert on European politics. His first book, uh, I particularly admire uh, The Politics of Economic Decline in East Germany, which I read uh, very carefully as a graduate student and uh, assistant professor. So. Uh, Jeff has also been a friend of CES, spent a, a year uh, here in 1995-96 or something, I think. Um, so in terms of our discussants, we have, we're fortunate to have two really good discussants with a perfect match for the book. Uh, Laia Lasalle Ventura, she's, she's provost, distinguished associate professor at Georgetown, um, political scientist who studies political violence, uh, civil wars, and ethnic conflict. She's the author of a book recent important book, Rivalry and Revenge, The Politics of Violence During the Civil War, 2017 book, which is a study that places Spanish Civil War in comparative perspective. It's an important agenda-sending book. Um, and then finally, uh, Jeffrey Birds, who is a professor at Northeastern and of history. He does work in international history of modern Russia, Ukraine, and the Soviet Union, um, and is the author of Holocaust and Rovno, I think 2013 yes, book. Case study of a pogrom in Western Ukraine. My grandparents are from Rovno, so I'm particularly keen to talk to you about this. Uh, so uh, again, welcome everybody. Uh, just one, what, thank everybody that, at CES for helping organize this. And what, just a one special call to Jan Bertsov, who was one of a gr graduate student in the history department who sort of helped me think of this and think of discussants and so on. So really, th thanks to Jan as well. So the way we're going to proceed uh, today is um, J uh, Jeff and Jason will speak for about 30 minutes, some way divided between the two of them. And then we'll hear from Laia for 15 minutes, and then Jeff Birds uh, for 15 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So thank you very much. So it'll be actually easier if I stand and okay. actually be able to see my slides. Uh, so do we have the slides? Great. So while it's coming down, let me, here, it's coming. So let me, first of all, thank, and I think I, I know Jason joins me in this, in thanking um, Daniel Zeblad and Jan Bertzlaw for, for organizing this, for inviting us to be here to present our work. Uh, it's, needless to say, an, an honor. Um, and um, we hope that my, my father always makes the joke that the important thing is not that you read the book, but that you buy the book. Um, so, but in this case, I hope that you read it and buy it. Um, so um, this is our, our cover. Um, 
our book, the most important thing, I guess, to keep in mind is that it's, it's about essentially a six-week period after the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, that is the, 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 the largest battle in human history, three million German soldiers at, attacking on the Eastern Front. The Germans, this was Blitzkrieg, and the Germans roll through very, very quickly, um, fighting their way, trying to get to Moscow as quickly as they can uh, to be, behead the Soviet Union. And on their way, in the lands that had been occupied by the Soviets between 1939 and 1941, um, we found, um, according to our research, that in about 9% of places, the locals um, in, in, in the, what had been eastern Poland um, set upon, turn against their Jewish neighbors um, in a pogrom. Now, we're not the first ones to have found this. Other historians have found it as well. We build on, on that work, um, the work that Jan Gross had started off, but others before Jan Gross had, had found these kinds of things too. Um, we concentrate mostly on what becomes Western Belarus um, and, and Western Ukraine. Um, this was the, the Kresy in Eastern Poland. These events had also happened in Romania and, and Lithuania. Um, there are pictures, there are YouTube videos. This is uh, Lviv, Lviv um, uh, July 1st, 1941. The picture tells you that it, there was also sexual violence involved in this. Um, Yash pogrom, June 28th, 1941. And one of the most famous in Kaunas, uh, the, Lith the garage massacre, um, on June 27th, 1941, um, there a Lithuanian man um, beat to death 45 to 50 Jews with a, a pipe wrench in a course of about 40 minutes. And afterwards, he takes up a, an, an, an accordion and plays the national anthem. And what you can't see from this side, this is a German army photographer took this, uh, you can't see from this side is that these are, there are civilians watching this and people with, with children on their, on their shoulders. Um, he describes it in, in the book. Um, a few observations. Um, as Daniel said, our main question is why were some communities toxic and others, others benign? This is a, a big question within political science now. A lot of people work on these kinds of questions, including Lion Balsells in, in her own work. Um, we asked a very simple question, what kind of places were these? And we used the tools of social science in order to try to figure that out. Um, were there characteristics about these places that became violent that set them apart from places that were not? And that's the, the, the simplest way of, of putting our empirical project. Um, how do we know what happened? Well, a lot of historians have already gone through this stuff, but we, we go back over some of the ma same materials, but we discovered also by, by extending our search through, through these materials, other pogroms. The main, the, the best source that we found is the, the, the archives of the narratives, the testimonies in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. Uh, there are 7,200 testimonies there that were taken really right after the war. The word Holocaust, of course, wasn't used yet. People hadn't seen Schindler's List. They didn't know what to say. Um, they, were, they were testifying, as far as we can tell, pretty accurately. Those, are, those testimonies are sometimes repeated again at Yad Vashem. Um, but small changes in details, but mostly pretty much the same. There are also Yizker books, which again sometimes repeat the same testimonies, but sometimes new ones are in there. The Einsatzgruppen reports, the German, the SS mobile killing units, um, also report on some of these pogroms. The NKVD, after the war, conducted these extraordinary commissions. We've used some of theirs. The, Pol the Poles uh, investigated within Poland after the war. We've used a bit of that. Um, and of course, there are memoirs. I was going to read you one, one pogrom, just in order to give you a feel for the kind of material th th that's here. This is in Shuchin, June 27th, 1941. This is from a letter that Chaya Saika Golding, a survivor of this pogrom, uh, wrote after the war, right after the war, for a letter that she sent from Amsterdam. And I quote, they hung up their swastika flag and pushed on further. The city lay in chaos. Authority passed to the hands of the Poles. This lasted about two weeks. All kinds of rowdies were let out of prison. Dombrovsky, Yakubchik, the well-known arrestees under the Bolsheviks, Shvetlovsky, chief of the guards, and Yankalitis, the director of the school, and others. They were full of rancor for the Bolsheviks and the Jews. Friday night, when the entire city slept quietly, the slaughter began. They, the Poles, had organized it very well. 
One gang in the news section, a second in the marketplace, a third on Lumjer Street. There in the news section, they murdered Ramovsky's family, the tailor, Esther Krieger, your neighbor and youngest daughter, Sora, Belich, Enikel, Pishke, Yashinsky, Meisler, the head of the yeshiva, all in their own houses and many more. They had killed Rosenthal's children in the marketplace. They also killed Heichka with her six-month-old child at breast and her older boy, Grecian. Later, the squads divided up the possessions of their victims among themselves. On readied wagons, they loaded the corpses and led them just outside of town. The Goyim immediately washed the bloodied floors, including the stones on the streets. A few hundred sacrifices had taken place, and still, the murders informed us, the, the, the massacres would last for two more nights. And if you'll hang with me for one more moment, it continues. Those remaining were stricken with fear. What do we do? How can we save ourselves? My mother ran to the priest to beg for the Jews. They offered no help. With Hannah, Liba, Zemel, and Salen, I ran to the Polish intelligentsia. There, too, we found no salvation. My mother with the other women ran after help to Gryeva, a nearby town. They were not let into the town. Curfew. What do we do? Night was falling upon us. Approximately 20 Germans entered the city, a field troop. We were afraid to show ourselves before them. Then I had an idea to try our luck with the soldiers. Maybe they would help us. With great difficulty, we chose a delegation and departed. The group of, of Germans consisted of soldiers and two officers. In the beginning, they declined to help us. This is not our business. We're fighting on the front, not with civilians, they explained. However, when I offered them soap and coffee, they softened up. They guarded the city at night and all remained quiet. I, with two other women, began to work for them, and later we were placed to work in the German headquarters. And so in this manner, the pogroms in Chuchin were stopped for a while. There's a lot going on there, and our book is trying to make sense of this kind of thing. This is a map of eastern Poland with the voivode ships, each dot representing one pogrom that we found. Why? Well, I want to give you a couple of, of what we consider to be certainly necessary conditions, but I think insufficient conditions, distinguishing pogrom from non-pogrom locations. The first, the most famous, is this order given on June 29th by Heydrich, saying nothing is to be put in the way of the self-cleansing actions of anti-communist and anti-Jewish circles in the newly occupied territories. The, this is undoubtedly true. No Germans, no pogroms. No Germans, no Holocaust. Right? I think undoubtedly true. Our book is not attempting to take the Germans off the hook in any way. However, the Germans were everywhere, and they were pretty thin on the ground. In fact, this order given on June 29th is five days after the war had started. Uh, sorry, seven days after the war had started, two days after the pogrom that I just read you from. The order was given, some historians argue, because they couldn't get the locals to do this. And in fact, in some of the Einsatzgruppen reports, that's in there. We tried. The second, all of these pogroms took place on territory that had been occupied by the Soviet Union between 1939 and 1941. No pogroms took place west of here, Right? or at least no major ones that we know of in the, in the older central German, central Poland, uh, central and western Poland. And very few pogroms took place in, after the beginning of June 22, 1941, in the eastern, right, in the part that was the old Soviet Union. But clearly, what this points to is the, the, the Soviet occupation having been a necessary condition. And indeed, it was a brutal occupation. And Jews did come to occupy offices that they had occupied before. But this had not occupied before. But if this were enough to have caused the pogrom, you should have seen more pogroms. The Soviets were everywhere. In some places, it's true, there were um, NKVD prisons found in Lviv, for example, in Boroslav, with prisons stuffed full of Ukrainian. Polish and sometimes Jewish corpses. And the Germans came in and said, look what the Jews have done to you before they had left. Look at those Soviets had done, the Jews had done to you before they had left. But again, the map of NKVD prison and the prisons and the map of pogroms does not match up very well, which leaves us with thinking that although, like the German presence, this may have been a necessary condition, it was not a sufficient condition for pogroms. Other explanations that may work, but may not work. 
Um, and we list two here, anti-Semitic nationalism and um, greed, avarice, loot, right, taking stuff from the Jews. Um, I illustrate that simply by putting up two anti-Semitic leaders. Um, the Stepan Bandera, the Ukrainian nationalist leader, um, head of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, um, who provided soldiers that would invade with the German army in 1941. Um, and the older Roman Domofsky, the well-known Polish nationalist and anti-Semite, and in fact, the, the most popular of all Polish parties. Not a majority, but the most popular of all Polish parties. Um, this may be true. Jason's going to talk a little bit about how we, how we test for this, how we, how we examine whether this is true. It was, in fact, the, the hypothesis that I think we started the book with, thinking that where these groups were the strongest, that's where you would find pogroms. That's where the surprise comes in, and I'll leave that to Jason. There were, of course, Jewish parties. This is a picture of Yitzhak Grunbaum who in the 1920s until 1935 was the most popular Jewish politician in the world that you've never heard of. Um, he, he was the head of the general Zionists in Poland. Um, who were the Zionists? What did it mean to be Zionist? What it did not mean was that you were leaving for Israel. Most Jews did not leave for Israel. Most Jews, almost no Jews spoke Hebrew. Zionist papers were mostly in Polish and Yiddish. What it did mean was in a kind of an aggressive, assertive um, statement of Jewish identity. You were not going to join the nation, the Polish nation building project. Grunbaum himself wanted to be a cabinet member in interwar Poland, but he wasn't. Interestingly enough, he leaves in 1935. He goes to uh, the Yeshuv, proto-state Israel, and he becomes Israel's first minister of the interior in 1948. A side, a side story, but an interesting one nonetheless. But they become an important part of our story because the, the general Zionists are, in fact, the most popular Jewish political party in interwar Poland. There were others. And just like many Jews, they, were, they had many parties. They were very fractious. Um, but the, this was by far and away the most popular Zionist leader. He also founded, along with other minorities, and they become important on our analysis as well, the Bloc of National Minorities. The Bloc included Germans, Belarusians, sometimes Ukrainians. In different parts of Poland, the, the Zionists ran on their own. But in, in central and, and northeastern Poland, they ran as part of the bloc of national minorities. And he was the most despised Jewish politician among Poles and Ukrainians because it, he, they were considered to be dangers to the national project. And finally, of course, in 1926, there's a coup in Poland. Um, run by this guy, Józef Pilsudski. And um, Pilsudski was an authoritarian, but he was not an anti-Semite. He believed in an accommodation, an accommoda a reasonable accommodation with Pol Pol Poland's national minorities. Um, he held one more election after he got elected, in 19 after, he after the coup. He, he held it in 1928. And we use that data as well. And Jason will talk about it. And the reason we know it was a pretty good free and fair election, and this is great for a dictator, he loses. Right? Now, he doesn't actually lose and leave power. What he does is he does not get his party with the very creepy name, the non-party bloc for cooperation with the government, right? kind of a Putinesque st style party. It does not gain its parliamentary majority. Um, and so that kind of sets the stage um, for what happens next. And, and Jason's going to tell you a little bit about our, our more detailed data and how we get at actually why these pogroms happened where they happened. Jason? I'll go around the other side. That's the, That's the clicker. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So um, just to uh, circle back to something Daniel actually said in the introduction. So the purpose of the, uh, you know, one of the purposes of the book was to thread the needle between a social science uh, debate about the reasons uh, 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 
civilians of one group attack civilians of other groups. So, so the reasons why the, this occurs in some uh, localities rather than others, so it might be Hindu Muslim violence in, in, in India, or it might be, uh, you know, something in Africa in theory. So, so why this happens on the, on the one hand as a generic worldwide uh, phenomenon, and also uh, a debate, uh, uh, a debate within the, you know, the Holocaust uh, research, uh, within East European research, about uh, the reasons that these pogroms took place. And so, so the, uh, the, the narrower version, you know, so the East European version, the, the area version, as Jeff was saying, was, uh, you know, on the one hand, you have people that argue that the root was anti-Semitism. That's one kind of a, a set of arguments. A second one, uh, referencing the NKVD and all of this other kind of stuff, was that it's a, a so, so on the one hand, it's anti-Semitic hatred. That's one argument. On the other hand, it's uh, revenge for uh, Jewish collaboration with communism, more or less. Uh, and in particular, Jewish collaboration with the Soviet occupation that took place in the two years prior to the outbreak of the pogrom. So the perception among non-Jews that uh, Poles and Ukrainians, that Jews were oppressing them through the vehicle of the Soviet occupation. So those are two sort of competing arguments. There are two others which sort of don't appear so frequently in the East European, uh, oh, actually one does, uh, the avarice one. So there's an economic argument that it's really about loot as opposed to about hatred or about revenge. And then another one uh, uh, which involves uh, state involvement. So. Uh, in the broader literature on this sort of violence, there's always the issue of, uh, you know, whether the state was actively encouraging this violence to take place or not doing anything to stop violence that was taking place. So what is the role of the state? And so our, uh, the choices we made about where to do this uh, and when, to, you know, where to study this and when uh, to study, because there were pogroms in Poland both after the Second World War and in the interwar period and, uh, you know, at other times, for example, after the First World War, there were hundreds of other uh, pogroms. And so we make the choices that we made, I'm going to talk about it in a moment, for very specific reasons. So let's get to those. Uh, first of all, sorry, uh, before we get to that, uh, I want to give a quick overview of the general problems that we find or, or, the, or, or the holes we find in the approaches that have been used before to study these phenomena. So one of them is overly aggregated units of analysis. So overly aggregated units, of, so the people that do data analysis will collect, uh, you know, ge geographic uh, data on, uh, you know, the occurrence of violence and then try to predict uh, variances in violence across geographic units. And typically, so, so not every study suffers from all of these things, but you can find all of these problems. Typically the, uh, the, the unit that's studied is larger than the locality, which is actually where the violence takes place. So violence takes place in localities, but usually the unit of analysis that studies is one administrative unit up. And so you have to add up the number of, uh, po of pogroms and then talk about how many are occurring in a unit. So that's one issue uh, with methodological consequences, which you can ask me about in the Q&A if you care. Uh, secondly, unsystematic samples, and so typically uh, people will, uh, you know, study place, study uh, uh, localities where pogroms took place, and then make conclusions. This often occurs, but then won't study uh, localities where pogroms do not take place. Right. So this is a, a, a kind of a, you know, a kind of a methodological problem. So unsystematic samples. Uh, disentangling the role of the state, I already referred to this. And so there's a problem. It's, it's very difficult to disentangle the role of the state uh, independently of what the civilians and other people are doing. Uh, that's a third problem. And finally, uh, there are, uh, you know, typically when this sort of violence takes place, there's a state that can punish perpetrators. Very obvious. And so, so in, a, in, a, in a normal, under normal circumstances, People that are potential perpetrators will say, I could do this, but the state will punish me. Therefore, although uh, I have every incentive to do this, uh, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to face the consequences. So it inhibits violence. Right? And this turns out uh, 
th this is important because we want what we really want to know is the underlying uh, the underlying uh, incentives for people to commit violence and not and not just whether that's realized as actual violence. And I'm going to say more about that in a moment. What we so so there's another explanation out there which is not the same as any of the other explanations that I just offered. And it's borrowed. It was originally uh, it was originally formulated to deal with race relations in the United States in the 1960s, and it goes by the name of power threat theory. And it basically uh, basically the theory says that a dominant group uh, you can read uh, 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 perceives the threat uh, of minority uh, minority demographics and the popularity of political groups that support equal rights for minorities. And when they perceive this as a threat, so when there are lots of minorities and, it, it's, uh, and the support for their equal rights are popular, the dominant group responds by repressing the minority. So in the US, after the Second World War, this was lynching. And when lynching was no longer possible, it was Jim Crow. That's, that's the US version of it. In Poland, a different version, uh, uh, first of all, so, so in Poland, the non-Jews, and Poles and Ukrainians in particular, uh, commit pogroms in response to Jewish demands or requests uh, or uh, advocacy for national equality. This is the Zionism that Jeff was referring to. This, we call this Zionism in that context. What this does is it alienates uh, uh, you know, non-Jews who, uh, who, who did not want the Jews to have equal national rights. Very important distinction. The, they were advocating to be a nation uh, to have national rights not just religious rights, national rights with, with Poles within the Polish state. So this inflames Polish and, and Ukrainian nationalists. I'm going to talk mostly about Poles today, a little bit about Ukrainians. So we can, we can uh, think about, when we want to think about, well, how do we detect you know, what's going on and why, uh, uh, this theory would predict the following, that where there are more Jews, where there's greater Jewish support or, or support for Zionist parties, which came, of course, mainly from Jews, uh, and greater uh, non-Jewish support for this government party, the non-party bloc for the... So, so Pilsudski's party uh, was the party that was most sympathetic to uh, equal rights for Jews, although not quite what the Zionists wanted. Where these things are in greater proportion, you should see a pogrom, because the non... Uh, because the Poles or the Ukrainians, depending on where we're talking about, would perceive the threat. And so, in essence, to, to, to borrow a, a now outdated term uh, uh, that used to be, uh, is used in the context of US race relations, you can think of this as, uh, not, uh, as Poles and Ukrainians thinking of the Jews as uh, too uppity. That would be a term we no longer use, but, uh, uh, but it, it, in a sense, that captures the attitude. It's like, who do you think you are demanding uh, equality with us? So here comes a research design. So, so why did we choose this area and this thing? Well, there are some good reasons uh, to do that. So as you know, uh, Jeff already said, it's uh, you know, after Arbor, uh, Operation uh, Bar Barbarossa, uh, Eastern Poland, the state collapse after the German invasion of the, you know, the USSR. So the state collapses. Um, there had been a two-year uh, Soviet occupation prior in which society was brutalized. All groups were brutalized. And so already you had a situation in which uh, uh, you know, norms were you know, not the normal norms after two years of Soviet occupation. So you have a kind of civil society collapse, if you will. I mean, the Soviet Union had destroyed uh, destroyed all the old organizations. You have the moral and ethical collapse because you know, people, groups were set against each other even during the Soviet occupation, much less after. And this is where the uh, uh, propensity to commit pogroms can actually be observed. So I have my incentive. Well, five years earlier, the Polish Warsaw would have arrested me, or I, I would have faced consequences. But in the summer of 1941, in this uh, several week period, there's no state to punish. So uh, everybody who had a propensity to commit a pogrom was never going to be freer uh, and more able to do it during this very special seven-week uh, period, which allows you to 
observe this underlying propensity, which is usually impossible to measure. So you can observe something which is very difficult under normal circumstances to measure. We get uh, roughly 10% uh, of the places have pogroms. Now, the puzzle, the first puzzle is why are there are so few pogroms. You know, one is too, okay, one is too many. I'm being filmed. Uh, so a bad edit can really get me in trouble. Uh, so, of course, you know, one is too many. Why are there, so theoretically speaking, it's interesting that only 10%. If you buy into the anti-Semitism hypothesis, and you believe the commonly common notion that uh, that Poles and Ukrainians at the during the period were, you know, there was some level there was some level of anti-Semitism in everybody. Uh, if if you believe the anti-Semitism argument, then ninety percent of the places should have had pogroms. Right? You have the incentive. Uh, you have the ability. The Germans are egging you on. The Germans are fine. The Germans will, uh, you know, bring you flowers for doing it. Uh, and the Polish state uh, collapses. So no better opportunity. Only ten percent, which casts doubt that uh, at least murderous anti-Semitism was prevalent in the Polish population. It's simply inconsistent with the facts, as we know them. So that's one thing. We'll uh, uh, circle back to some other things. Uh, data sources. Uh, uh, Jeff's already talked about uh, you know some of them. Obviously, the pogrom information is the key. The outcome variable is the key. We build on the work of a lot of historians. Uh, 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 you know, many Polish, uh, uh, German, Ukrainian, Russian historians that have been doing very grueling work in the archives. So we build on uh, build on them. Add a few of our own. Uh, you know, a few of our uh, a little bit of our own research to it to come up with. Uh, uh, basically, what we think is a pretty accurate accounting for all of the settlements in, in those Cressy of both where pogroms occurred and, importantly, where they did not occur, where they did not occur. So what we do is we use electoral data uh, as an important uh, uh, explanatory variable, but it's very easy to think that this is an electoral argument. It's not an electoral argument. We use electoral data, in essence, as a as a way of uh, measuring an underlying kind of a attitude within these localities. So, so this isn't a case where, uh, where there was evenly matched political parties, a pogrom was committed in order to help one side win and the other. This is not what this is about. Absolutely not. Basically, uh, we, you know, the support for Zionist parties is an indicator of the strength of advocacy for Zionism in a local place. And the support for the National Democrats, which was a, a right-wing uh, anti-Semitic Polish party, support for that party is used as an indicator of kind of the anti-Semitism, uh, the prevalence of anti-Semitism, and on and on. The communist vote, there's a Zionist vote, and the BBVR, this is Pilsudski's party. So we use these as, as kind of proxies. But it's not about elections as such. So the first, uh, the first slide I'd uh, like to talk about, uh, so this is now the results. So, so how are, you know, what are we able to conclude from all of this? Well, uh, one of the most influential books uh, in this whole debate that's been going on for quite a while was written by Jan Gross, Neighbors, uh, in 2000 or 2001, in which he studied one uh, place, Yedvabne. In which, uh, you know, as he says, uh, the Polish half of the village murdered the Jewish half of the village. And it uh, has caused, uh, you know, the problem is that Yedvabna has come to symbolize uh, what the pogroms were about and also to symbolize uh, and also as a stand in for Polish Jewish relations. The problem is it's not a normal place, it's not representative. I mean, obviously not normal, but uh, I should say it's not representative of pogroms. And this is an example of how it's not. Uh, so what we do is we have the demographic information for Yedvabna, and this is the Polish percentage Jewish. There were Belor uh, Belarusians also in this area. Support for the uh, anti-Semitic party and support for the Zionist party. And one thing to note here is that Yedvabna is actually maybe the only, so, so and it's compared with its uh, with its uh, kind of provincial, uh, the provincial average. So it's compared with the province within which it resides. And you can see that 
Actually, Yedvavna was a Polish Jew. There were no Belarusians. It was Poles versus Jews, for one thing. And more importantly, uh, there was political polarization between Zionists for the minorities bloc and, and the right-wing Poles. So, so it was a Polish-Jewish thing in which the Poles were, uh, were, the Poles were extremely nationalist and the Jews were very Zionist, which is not indicative of the rest of the, I mean, it doesn't happen in most of the other pogroms. So this is a, essentially a criticism of the way the literature, ha, uh, the way the debate has evolved, which should become less Yedvabna-centric and more about the broader distribution of pogroms that took place. That's a kind of a comment on the historical debate. Then there's a, one other thing. So, so we have a methodological problem is that in general, when you have a political party in a place and you have two groups, uh, uh, and you have a result for the political party, it's hard to know how many of each group voted for the party unless you have survey data. It's like if the Democrats uh, get a vote, you know, if the Democrats get, uh, how many is it here? 95 or 99% uh, Democrat here. Uh, uh, you know, it's hard to know, uh, you know, what proportion of those are white people, what proportion of those are African American or whatever, unless you have surveys. Well, the, the same is true generically. If you make the assumption that only Poles vote, vote for the extreme nationalist Polish party, it's a reasonable assumption, and, and only Jews in this place vote for the minorities bloc because there were most, mo the biggest minority was Jews, a little more problematic in the Jewish case, then you can back out the proportion of Poles that support anti uh, the anti-Semitic nationalist party and the proportion of Jews who were Zionist, and you can see, of course, it goes up. If you believe these estimates, things are even more polarized than the, elect the raw electoral data will tell you. Secondly, so the empirical announcement, I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to talk about Ukrainians at all in the main thing. People can ask me uh, for the Ukrainian, uh, you know, ask us for their Ukrainian results. I'm only going to talk about the Polish, uh, uh, the results for where the Poles were the primary perpetrators. The analysis is, uh, uh, the, the steps are very easy to understand. The first thing we do is we take all the places where pogroms occurred in two voivodeships in the north, and we separate them out into two piles. All, this, all the localities where pogroms occurred are in one pile, all the localities where pogroms didn't occur in another pile, and we take the median value of these various things and just compare the median values, a purely descriptive uh, exercise. So um, in blue, uh, in blue and uh, what color is this? Orange. Orange. I'm colorblind. It could be green for me. Um, th these are the variables that are basically associated with the power threat theory. And the blue ones are, are kind of consistent with power threat. So the more Jews. So by the way, the power threat theory doesn't go to the next level of specialization. I'll, is it numbers of Jews or proportion? Is it you know, numbers of people or proportion of people? This is a decision by researchers. Uh, it's, not actually in the, it's not actually in the theory. So the more Jews you have, the more likely a program. This is not an earth-shattering conclusion. Uh, the, the greater the support for the minorities block, the more likely there will be a pogrom. So, so this is uh, essentially the power threat theory. The thing that goes against is support for the government party, which is uh, bigger uh, you know, uh, in places that don't. So that goes against. Uh, the theory as an indicator, but the other indicators are four. Uh, you can see that uh, in uh, the places where pogroms occurred, uh, polls were more nationalist, but the, but the effect is more uh, attenuated, if you will, in this descriptive. Uh, this is purely descriptive and univariate. Finally, I want to comment on the communists, because the the idea that uh, you know the, the people that think that pogroms were uh, revenge for Jewish support for communism and specifically for the Soviet occupation, well, how would you know that empirically? Uh, you would look for the vote for com. One way is to look for the support for communist parties in 1928, as being you know localities where there was a lot of sympathy for communism. You would expect, if the revenge hypothesis holds that uh, communist support should be much greater where pogroms occur than where they don't occur. But the reverse holds. And the reverse holds, we think, 
uh, uh, due to uh, other research, uh, or earlier research that we did, it's because it wasn't the Jews that were communists, it was non-Jews that were communists. And, non, uh, and uh, uh, people, uh, non-Jews that were in the communist movement uh, would not have committed a sort of an ethically based pogrom. Uh, it would have been unthinkable. Not that they weren't violent in other ways, uh, but this ethnic, uh, ethnic way of things, things was antithetical to the way communists uh, thought. And so this is a plausible explanation for the reverse of the, of the relationship. And then there's some other things in gray. Uh, by the way, uh, I do want to mention the Orthodox Jewish list. So these are Orthodox Jews. So the minorities block is the nationalist Jews. The Orthodox, uh, uh, the Orthodox Jewish list is for Orthodox Jews who are actually enemies of the nationalists. So it's not just having Jews uh, as such. Uh, you see the relationship uh, is you know, not very strong. And also, it's not very strong in Ukraine, where there were more Orthodox uh, Jews. And I'll, I'll circle back to that in brief concluding remarks. And then uh, uh, I'll do this quick because I think most people are not political scientists. This tells you we're right. So, uh, so one thing you want to do is one thing you want to do is try to say, well, a, a bunch of these things seem to matter, but which matters more? Which matters more? And so we have ways of statistical ways of uh, doing that. And basically, you can see uh, that uh, you know basically anything that touches this. Uh, this, uh, this line here doesn't matter. It has a zero effect, statistically speaking. And anything where the line doesn't touch it is affected. And you see the minorities block, even the numbers of Jews doesn't matter. Uh, what really matters is support for the minorities block. And these are done. Uh, ask me about uh, the details if you care. Um, and then you can see, uh, if you want to know, well, how much, uh, how much minorities uh, block support is associated with a given increase in the probability of a pogrom. Here, you can also back that out. So as you go from uh, 0 to 0 0.3, you know, the probability of a pogrom uh, you know, jumps dramatically. I should say the data here uh, are very, uh, you know, they're distributed in an unusual way. So there's a very low, uh, the, the explanatory variables tend to have a very low range. So it's not the case that you have tons of places with 95% Jews. Most places in this area, uh, the vast majority, you know, 99% of the places are probably under 30% Jews. And so you're working in a, uh, with a very uh, uh, limited range on the explanatory variables. That's why we only go up to 0.3. One thing I want to, uh, uh, well, one other thing, and then there's only one more slide, and then we're done. Why are you giving me the? The finger, as they say. Uh, uh, one other thing I, I want to uh, address is that, uh, uh, so this book is not, uh, our argument is not couched in a kind of causal terms. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you might argue that, uh, you might argue that uh, Zionism was powerful where there had been prior violence. And so we have the kind of the relationship reversed. It's actually violence that causes Zionism, Zionist support. It's a plausible argument, and not Zionist, which uh, you know, not, not Zionism on the as an explanatory variable, but uh, the other way around, and uh, and it's plausible but wrong, extremely unlikely. Uh, first of all, historically, Jews uh, Jews responded to popular violence by appealing to authority, the duke, uh, the noble, or the pope, depending on who, the circumstances. It could be the church uh, authority, or it could be the secular authority. Secondly, uh, after 1880, uh, the people that really, you know, uh, wanted to re re respond to violence emigrated to Palestine, uh, so, so they made Aliyah. And finally, the third uh, Jewish response was shedding their particularity by becoming communists. And so it is an actual phenomenon that, uh, you know, uh, a, a join a universalizing movement. But they did not join Zionism as we define it. They did not stay and try to become nationalists. Ukraine. Oh. Um, maybe I should stop and then uh, yeah, pick up uh, sort of broader interpretations. Thank you. Yes, they did submit.
Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be in this panel. This, it's been great to, to read this, this book and, and to take lots of notes on it. Uh, it very much relates to my own research, so I felt, I mean, I'm not an expert on the region. I'm a political scientist who does research on political violence and violence against civilians, so my comments are going to be more about the theory and some of the, the issues with the empirics, but not so much about the regional aspect of the book. So this is a, I think it's a very interesting book that, that explores a very difficult phenomenon to study with limited historical data. So and one of the things I want to say is that um, I think that the authors have made a, a, a very important effort in putting together um, a data set of pogroms, but also like uh, a lot of information on on potential covariance independent variables that um, when you look at it as a, as a product, as a final product, it might be very easy, but I'm sure it's taken a lot of time and going through lots of archives and, and, and you can see in the, in the book that there are a number of times in which they, they acknowledge that they would like to do things differently using a different measure, but data is not available. So I think that this is something to be praised. It's also something that it's a, it's a recent trend in political science that we, we see more and more political scientists now doing historical work and trying to, to uh, collect data from archives and, and doing these kind of exercises. And um, I think this is an important book that, that, that uh, does this. Um, and, 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 and the authors have been working on this for a long time, so it's, it's kind of a benchmark book along the lines. Um, so that said, I want to I wanna give some, some comments and things that I think can be discussed in, uh, in the Q&A. Um, I, I think that on, I mean, again, this is a very difficult phenomenon, right? So if you think about it, I mean, when we're trying to understand why these things happen, right? I mean, it's, it's extremely puzzling, right? It's like, why, why, I mean, some of the things that you describe in the book, right? Why is there this killing that is so public and there's this carnivalesque character, right? Why, what, what on earth like makes people behave this way, right? It's really hard to, to, to understand. So I, I wish there was a little bit more uh, of political psychology in the book in more about what, I mean, who are the, the, first of all, who are the relevant actors, right? We have the perpetrators on the one hand, the people who actually perpetrate the killing. But then we have the bystanders or the defenders. And, and, and the authors say that you emphasize very much the role of these people, right? How much the, the, the presence of people in a locality that will support these actions or will react and will say, we don't want this to happen, is going to have an impact on whether this happens, happens or not. And then we have the victims, right? And, and the victims are, are not just pure victims, we know from from recent war by Evgeny Finkel and other people that we, there, there's also some agency, right, about what these, these people, potential victims, can do. So I think that, I mean, I, I would like to see more like, like what is the psychology of each of these set of actors, right? I mean, again, why are they doing what they're doing? Um, and I know it's a very difficult question. Uh, but so, for instance, you bring up the defenders in one of the villages in Galicia, and but but it's unclear to me what are the motives. Why, why do these people risk their lives to defend others, right? And so I think it's important to like dig more on, on these issues. Then thinking about uh, the data and type of, that the type of variation that you're trying to explain, uh, reading the book I realized that, that the alternative to pogroms in your study is not peace. There are two alternatives. One is peace. The other is massacres by the Germans. In other words, there are a number of places in which we don't see pogroms in the map that it's not that they didn't have any violence against Jews. It's that the violence was perpetrated by the Germans themselves, right? So I think that in a way, this is, this is important, right? Because it's here we have the story about like where the Germans were, what were they doing, right? And so th these are again three different potential scenarios, right? And pogroms were perhaps a residual strategy. Like in the places where the Germans couldn't do it, then this was happening uh, in this kind of more indirect way. Uh, in this sense, I think that, and again, I'm not an expert in this particular region, in this particular uh, moment of history, but I was wondering if like, there could be any way to try to measure 
uh, for con German control of territory and how much how much were they present because this could have an impact on on whether we see problems or not. Um, so overall, kind of, I, I, I would like to say that maybe like pogroms should be studied together. It's like it's a phenomenon that should not be just like isolated. It's like it's a phenomenon that's happening together with uh, these massacres and together with civil war violence. So perhaps we should try to understand this as a repertoire of action, right? In some places, there's just like pure genocidal violence by the German, German actors. In other places, there's, there's pogroms. In other places, there's another type of violence. So I, I, I think that that would be important maybe to do in future research. In terms of the main hypothesis, um, this is really interesting to me because it really relates to, to the argument in my book, right? And my book about the Spanish Civil War, about the, and I don't want to talk about my book so much, just that uh, in the dynamics of violence in the, that I had find in the Spanish Civil War, I find that there's more violence in places where there's more parity between two groups, right? Where there's there's this, this kind of curvilinear relationship, right? So in, in it, and, and the, the, the story I, I tell is more about uh, getting rid of, of political rivals. But your story is a bit different, right? Your story is about power threat, right? So in places where this minority becomes more powerful or like that becomes a kind of power, uh, threatening, then there's a reaction. And there's, in a way, violence is a form to remove this threat. And but but I was confused sometimes because in, in a few moments in the book you kind of bring the political rivalry hypothesis that was kind of confusing to me. Um, I think that it's the threat removal and the, the power threat hypothesis is more convincing in your case for a number of reasons. But on the one hand, um, this kind of threat removal violence doesn't have to be targeting political enemies, right? It's kind of it's kind of more emotional. And it's more like it's kind of a it's a process that makes it, makes people be threatened about a particular outgroup, and then there's this violence against the this outgroup, but this violence doesn't have to be against the political leader of the other group or or like the priest in the case of Spain, right? Which like people who had a particular status in society. This violence can be against breastfeeding women. And pregnant women they talk about in the book, right? So because it's just like there's this dehumanization of the other, this categorization of the other that basically that well, it's just because you're a member of this out group, we're just gonna target you. Uh, so I think that it's, that there's a little, it's a fine line, but there's a bit of a difference. And I mean, it's something that I mean I really would like to discuss with you in the Q and A. Like, what do you think is is happening? And and again, it's just like again, this more of an emotional process than something strategic in which there's like a, 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 a the, the selective elimination of the threats. Same thing with the lynchings that you bring up in chapter six, right? It's, I mean, it's not that the lynchings happen to eliminate particular threats. It, it's lynchings happen because there's a, like, uh, maybe like this minority that is becoming threat, uh, threatening and you want to intimidate, they, they, you want to intimidate them, right? Just like send the signal, like we are the bosses here. You cannot, you're not, never gonna be powerful, right? Something like that. So, um, so and, and, and along these lines, I feel that maybe your story is not so much about local cleavages, it's about the national cleavage here, it's like these competing nationalisms, right? Zionism becomes strong and like there's this potential alternative, right? Uh, um, Jews might be like a, um, a powerful minority in, 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 in the region and, and then there's the willingness to eliminate this threat, but it's, this comes from the from the national level to the local level. It's not just like a local level. Image. Okay, so uh, so overall, I have to say I'm quite convinced by your theoretical explanation, and I can see these kind of things happening in other parts of the world, uh, even like at the lower intensity level. I can see this happening in Europe right now, right in a number of countries where like where like national minorities become more powerful. Uh, uh, like there are like some kind of like re um, reaction from state uh, uh, nationalism against these minorities, and this again I think it could be applied to many other cases. Um, but one thing I felt when I was reading the book was that maybe there's just no need to adjudicate between anti-Semitism, power threat, and revenge factors because in a way all these factors were present and all these were present and all these factors had a combined impact on pogroms. In other words, anti-Semitism was like 
a necessary condition. It's not sufficient, but it's not. It's a necessary condition for this to happen, right? And it was ubiquitous, right, in in in, in the area, right, in the region. So, revenge. I'm not convinced that it was not a factor, right? I mean, it seems that it was a factor that after the Soviet occupation, um, there was this 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 um, this uh, resentment against Jews. But uh, because, as as Roger Peterson has explained, right, just because they had gained a little bit more status than they had before during the Soviet occupation, but just just because of that, right? So it was not that it was not present, right? So it, it almost feels that these were kind of like uh, facilitating factors and this kind of power threat element was my, more like a precipitating factor, like it makes like a difference between between this, these cases. So I would just say, I was just going to say like, and I think you feel similarly, like it's not that these other things don't matter, right? It's just that these things are kind of more ubiquitous and, and the power threat can be explained in this local variation. Finally, in terms of like uh, the argument about, and again, this is going back to the mechanisms and what the, the big puzzle of why these things happen, right? You you bring up the idea of like, well, there's a moment of state collapse, and after Soviet rule, there had been so much degradation and new humiliation that you literally, I quote you here, it's like the stage was set for neighbor and neighbor violence, and I keep thinking, but why? What right? What makes like this this moment a moment in which like people all of a sudden are willing to start killing their neighbors, right? And again, this might be a question that we'll never be able to answer even if you spend like decades trying to study, study these, these things, right? Um, but, but I would like to hear from you about what, what do you think is happening in the, this particular moment that makes, makes you know, this, this sets the stage for, for this violence. Um, I don't know if I have, that's it, right? I have some comments on the empirics, but I think it's, yeah, we can wait. yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Jeff. We have to set up one sec, so. Thank you. Um, I'm coming at this as an historian rather than a political scientist, as a, someone who does area studies mainly in Ukraine, but also Poland. My wife is Polish, and that has helped a little bit too. Uh, so I have to deal with a nationalistic argument all the time uh, it, uh, over dinner or breakfast or just about just before we go to sleep when we wake up, uh, that sort of thing. Um, she hates Jan Gross, and that gives you a sense of, of what home life is like. Um, the my. <laughs> ex-wife was Ukrainian, the granddaughter of Nazis who were responsible for the Lemberg and Lemberg provoke. So, you know, I've married well. Uh, to, uh, to um, I, I wanted to comment on two comments uh, that were made, the verbal remarks, before I get into the, to the gist of, uh, of the book itself. Um, the book, I think, is an extraordinary effort to pull together and ask a lot of really good questions. It's extraordinarily well written. Um, it's wonderfully uh, short. Um, but what the, uh, the two authors have done uh, in their research in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw is really uh, a major piece of research and major contributions. Um, the best parts of the book, for me as an historian, are the eyewitness reports. There was one. I I'd mentioned to Jeff just before the talk uh, that uh, of, of one of the priests that he quotes from who turns out to be a pseudonym for somebody I've been looking for for years. Uh, he is actually was the chaplain for the Noctegal division, and he's talking about how the only good Jew is a dead Jew. It's the first tie we have directly tying these two phenomenon. Um, but that also is by way of a slight criticism, because if you know the field better, then you recognize who this guy is, and you're able to, uh, to pull it through. I know that because of my wading through Ukrainian history for a decade, and people constantly correcting me because of all the pseudonyms that these people use, and trying to figure out who they are at one time or another. Um, the other things that are a shortcoming that uh, is, I would blame on uh, Cornell Press is they 
because I'm just shocked that they didn't notice it. Uh, Zolkiev and Zlocha, for instance, are, are the same place. And you, you list them as two uh, separate anecdotes, uh, actually in the same section, and they're exactly the same place. It simply depends on whether you're using Polish version of the Ukrainian version, Polish version of the Russian version. They have multiple names for it. But um, the uh, on the comments, uh, mainly from the second set of comments that we got, um, I, I want to restore some sanity to the, to the context. Um, remember that uh, this is the Holocaust, that there were 2.8 million Jews we're talking about in these regions uh, who uh, were killed. Um, and uh, for those who remain behind, 98% are killed, 2% survive, mainly these are women and children, because the standard treatment of the local police was always to make uh, all the men, uh, partisans, fugitives, drop their pants, and if they were uh, circumcised, they were immediately taken out and shot, as a rule. Um, so that we're talking to, to try to pick out one phenomenon of anti-Jewish violence that is the pogrom of 19, summer 1941, and separate it from a whole sliding scale of abuse of Jews is, I think, not entirely fair. I don't want to be an ontological nihilist on this, um, because when I wrote about uh, rape and sexual abuse of Jews a few years ago in a piece, there were those who got angry and said, well, their genocide is far worse, and so we don't need to talk about that part. I think varieties of exploitative and abusive experience fit uh, the dialogue, but to try to uh, cherry pick one and correspond to other things is to me as an area study scholar uh, really uh, not the best use of one's time. Uh, but that's just from my perspective. Um, the second one was something Jason said, uh, to quote it exactly, I think it was, uh, you said that ethnic ethnicity as a factor was antithetical to communist thought. Um, that goes against everything we know. I can cite Young. Violence, not ethnicity. Um, violence as well. Uh, Jan Gross's book, Revolution from Abroad, talks about how uh, the uh, uh, in West Ukraine, Western uh, Belarus in particular, uh, this was a war against the Polish pawns, basically. It was uh, what Terry Martin here calls an affirmative action empire, as well as a really fine article he did separately on this, talking about the national campaigns under Stalin, where he leaves behind Kordonizatsia, that is the idea of using the folk element as a means by which to spread the, the gospel of communism. They reverse it. Stalin grows distrustful of it sometime 34, 35, and he begins to destroy those very networks. And by 37, 38, these are the national campaigns. What Terry Martin calls it is, uh, uh, ethnic war as class war. Um, that basically uh, the intervention in Western Ukraine, Western Belarus, was a declaration of, of war by the communists against the Poles. And that will last until roughly July of 1940, a year before Barbarossa. Almost um, over 90% of those in the high security prisons of the NKVD, when they go in and Stalinize over the course of that first year, until Stalin sends a signal. It's enough with the polls already. It's time to arrest in proportion to uh, local population. And only then do they begin to arrest on a mass scale Ukrainians, uh, Jews, depending where you are, Lithuanians, et cetera. And that's why the, the prisons are filled with these ethnic nationalists at the time. So they make sure they declare war on every ethnicity is the point I'm trying to take, that is Soviet power, so that uh, if one does not, if one lives in the area, you could not but recognize that you're at war with the communists. So that when you're talking about 1921 electoral preferences uh, uh, and trying to gauge how this fits in, uh, I think it's, it's uh, a mistaken way to, to approach it. We'll just put it that way. Now, um, five comments. Uh, first, the authors, I feel, are, are trying to define a moving target. It's a fallacy to assume that we know much about this phenomenon at all. Um, the author's data of some 200 pogroms in three main regions is impressive. 30 years ago, we knew almost nothing about this. There were simply anecdotes until, as they point out, Young Gross's neighbors. After that, there's a huge two-volume study by the IPN, the Institute of National Memory in Poland, back when it was uh, before uh, law and justice got a hold of it and turned it into a nationalist instrument. But back then, they came out and they said, no, not only is Yedvabde not an outlier, in fact, there are over 40 villages and towns that we found in the same area that are exactly the same thing. 
And so it's important to recognize that it does fit a certain scale, but this is all we knew. As of, say, a decade ago, we only knew less than 50, 60 cases, and historians have been pouring over the material in order to get more. Um, the authors cite Mirsav uh, Trichik's book, um, extraordinary book, on the eastern part of Poland uh, at this time, northeastern part, um, and he brings out over 128 additional towns and villages just in that Palesia section in eastern Poland, um, and for some reason you decided not to include that in your database. He does do a a closer case study of 15, which are in your database, but cited from other sources, just to point that out. What I'm trying to point out is this is a moving target. And so I think it's uh, a hasty generalization to say that 10% uh, versus 90%, um, even if we're going to compare oranges to oranges, that is pogroms only. Not, um, and the one that really uh, uh, makes me uncomfortable is one that Laya brought up as well. How can we consider only the pogrom violence not side by side with the German violence. Remember again, let's step back. By the end of the war, 98% of the Jews of Poland and Ukraine are dead. 10% um, or so, I know of the Ukrainian numbers, we have far better numbers because a lot of them survive uh, by retreating, walking literally to the Soviet rear. Uh, not as many Poles got away, but we have no idea. And there have been all kinds of discussions trying to figure out how that works out. My main point then is that we're learning more about locations of, uh, of uh, anti-Jewish violence as more studies appear. I guarantee you there will be more. Omar Bartov's study of Buchach uh, is, is a good example that has won all kinds of awards, just came out uh, less than a year ago. Um, the basic premise of the authors, I think, therefore, is questionable. The main centers of anti-Jewish violence get mentioned by the authors themselves. Uh, these are towns where NKVD maximum security prisons existed. Um, I put up on the board uh, the sample. I guess I'll use my, yeah, it does work. We're talking about a 1,500 mile line, the Curzon line, uh, from Romania all the way up until uh, the Baltic Sea. And this area, uh, to give you a sense of the long-term trajectory of that area, there are 2.5 million men uh, in Europe who take up arms dress in German uniforms, serve in German formations by the end of the war. 2.2 million come from these zones. Um, that is the same zones that, the, uh, that they're looking at for other indicators. So what we're talking about is fanatically supportive to an anti-Soviet point of view um, that leads people to be willing to, uh, to serve in that way. Um, we also uh, get from the same region about 85% or so of the East European or perceived as Soviet uh, refugees, especially from uh, from uh, the northern parts, uh, we're talking about uh, again the, the northern half um, are going to go west instead of east after the war, and they become the Cold War. Uh, refugees who helped to define the crusade for freedom and all of these things having, uh, so that our own perceptual windows are defined by that same group uh, in, in the way it fits in. Um, it's not entirely reasonable, I think, to distinguish a program from other acts of violence targeting Jews. Eyewitness testimonies from the era reflect a hostile atmosphere towards Jews that was ubiquitous, and that went from older people to children and children themselves as perpetrators, isolating pogroms when they appear, when they don't appear, concluding from this that most non-Jews were not inclined towards anti-Jewish actions, as I think a, an outrageously hasty generalization, one that glosses over a large variety of anti-Jewish violence everywhere else that I, I, I'm, I'm certain the authors know this. It's just that when we begin to uh, try to make it fit into the, into the data that they have, I think it breaks down. After 17 September 1939, when the Soviets chose, uh, and I've seen the line of command, Stalin's order, um, right after Molotov-Ribbentrop, within, say, three days, that a line of command, the order of, of, of uh, Soviet forces and the invasion was set for 17 September. It was a master plan so as not to appear as if they had some agreement that everyone uh, knew they had. Um, and the Soviets begin to move into these areas. The communist option changes fundamentally. It's no longer a question of, uh, oh, how do I feel about Zionism? How do I feel about Jewish rights? The general perception is that the Soviets have moved in. They are uh, basically brutal uh, in a lot of these zones, initially against the Poles and then uh, targeting other groups, as I said. And uh, interwar politics, therefore, ceased to matter as of September 1st, 1939, from my point of view. I just don't think it's a reliable indicator. 
From this point on, everything uh, was about the Soviets and their collaborationist Jews, um, and it fit very well in with Alfred Rosenberg as a Volksdeutsch from, the, uh, from Estonia who brings translations of this material to Hitler, and this is what's deeply affecting Hitler's own perceptions of what's going on, namely the Gila Comuna, the so-called Jewish communist conspiracy that became an intrinsic part of uh, East European popular culture for over 700 years, the uh, ideas of blood libel, less so obviously the communists, but particularly after 1918. I know you said you have five points. I'm hoping we, we might be able to finish okay. by a quarter till. So okay. All right. I will do that. Okay. The authors consistently rejected any significant role of German agency as well. Uh, they insist the summer 1941 pogroms are not part of the Holocaust, but pre-Holocaust. Um, is that because the Vansi Protocol is not a, 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 until January 42? I'm, I'm guessing, but to separate it is to lose something. Um, these are the data from Ilya Altman for the Eastern Front, and what we have is roughly 1.25 million to take the middle ground of the estimate of, say, Soviet regional Jews who are dead by January 1942. That is when the final solution uh, begins. 40% of Soviet Jews are already dead before the final solution is adopted. Only 50,000, only, again, in, 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 in quotes, obviously, as a, as a proportion, but a small proportion are killed in the pogroms. Most of these uh, 1.2 million are killed in mass shooting operations that begin on the Bobby Yar variety in September 1941, leading up through uh, end of December, beginning of January. That is when the German occupation and their allies take over the responsibility of killing Jews because it's uh, uh, because of a variety of factors that we don't have to talk about now. Um, another factor not raised in the book is a matter of pogroms on the Eastern European uh, ritualized uh, uh, acts of anti-Jewish violence. Um, here, I, I strongly recommend that people look at Polish anthropologist Joanna tokarska bakir's work, a lot of it available in English on the history of pogroms, and in particular, 700 years of blood libel in uh, Poland. And to contrast, traditional pogroms before summer 41 and what's going on in summer 41. What's missing in every single account that they present, every single account I've ever seen. There's no blood libel. Summer 41 does not tie the Jews to blood libel anymore. There is no rumor of blood libel, like lynchings and the implication in the American South that this black man had somehow uh, sexually violated a white woman. Um, that was kind of the ubiquitous uh, coexistent factor in, in the American South. Here, uh, we're talking about the same um, uh, uh, with respect to uh, pogroms. And without blood libel, it's obviously something altogether different than the pogroms we know about in East European history. What do we know? What do we learn from it? Let me give you one example why it's important to include uh, German agency. This is Lutz, 24 June 1941, a monument created by uh, the Wehrmacht, the German military. Now, what we're saying is, Two days before, 48 hours into the largest military attack in history, three million soldiers, they come in and then they stop for two days to construct this monument. What does the sign say? Very important. Um, basically, uh, it's a German soldier's photograph, a bunch of them, handwritten in pencil on uh, June, July 41, Lutz, Western Ukraine. The sign in German reads, here lie 800 Ukrainians betrayed by Jews, murdered by Bolsheviks. Lutz, 24 June, 1941. To me, they're sending a very clear signal where they stand. The Wehrmacht is a liberation army uh, helping to liberate people from the Gido Comuna, the Jewish Communist Conspiracy, and we're going to pick this up. They have intelligence. We know about over 2,000 German crossovers into Soviet territory in 19, spring of 1941 alone, where they're perfectly well informed about the fact that the, that the Soviets are doing mass killings. And so they planned the line of attack to overlap with uh, cities and towns associated with the NKVD uh, maximum security prisons. The authors clearly know about this. They simply choose not to make that as important. This is also intrinsically important as part of what followed that afternoon, a donk parade, the, a thank you parade, uh, where Ukrainians dress up in national costume and thank the Germans for liberating them from, uh, from these Jews, the Jewish communists and the like, and what it represents. Now, um, I'll just mention, rather than go through everything, uh, right, I, I'll, I'll make one more point. Um, the 
Um, why is it necessary not to separate this? Um, the authors mentioned June 27, 1941 in Bialystok, where the Germans openly killed 2,000 Jews. Um, I, the IPN, the, uh, the Jewish Historical Institute, um, concluded that that was the signal to surrounding villages and towns that it was open hunting season on Jews, and that's what provokes the 40 of pogroms that follow, including Yedvavne. June 27, 1941 is when they do their mass killing. 14 July, 1941 is when uh, the uh, non-Jewish members, Polish members of the community in Yedvavne killed uh, the Jewish population, creating this episode that has so wrung out in so many different ways. Um, what I do in uh, the remainder that I don't have to do is to try to take you through um, uh, the microhistory of two pogroms, um, basically to show you that the uh, that everybody is keenly aware of what's going on. Everybody is playing their role uh, according to it. How these roles are decided, I think, is is related to uh, factors. Uh, everything from where where and how the nationalists were trained. Uh, we know, for instance, that Mikola Lebed, the boss to that same priest, the chaplain in, in the uh, uh, in, in, in Noctegal, um, he uh, actually had in Zakopane, in one of these schools, as he lectured to uh, 100 Ukrainian nationalists, um, he uh, tied a Jew to a wall and executed him, basically showing them how to interrogate a target. Um, that was the way they it imparted uh, to the cadres that uh, we will build our state upon uh, bones of, of Jews, which is still the, 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 the argument that's made. The last point, guaranteed, is if we move beyond Poland and Ukraine, recognize this 1,500 miles. How do we explain the fact that the exact same procedure for a pogrom, which has no historical antecedent before 1941, no blood libel is the point, um, suddenly appears in every other national grouping as well. And uh, I can show you the photos, for instance, from uh, Estonia at Kutisade, where which was the maximum security prison for the Baltic states, basically. Uh, they, uh, uh, all of these uh, prisoners, about 150 of them were killed. Uh, when the Germans finally get there in, uh, in August of 1941, they stage a, uh, what becomes the model. Uh, we go in. We excavate the corpses. Uh, we have whatever Jews or other enemies are around to do that work. Then we cleanse the bodies. We put them into heroes' prisons as victims of Soviet repression. And then we kill uh, the perpetrators, the Jews, the Jewish communists. That's it. Thank you. All right. Um, let's, I'm sorry we've gone over here with our presentations, but let's open it up and maybe collect it. I'll call if people have questions. And I'll, I would like to give the um, authors also a chance to respond to the comment, uh, questions and comments. So maybe if we could collect a couple of Questions. Yes, Fola. Thank you. So I really enjoyed reading the book. Um, and uh, I'll ask a political scientist question, which you actually talk about in the book, but I think it might be fun for, for the discussion. So when I think of the group threat, group power threat theory, I think about the Ukrainian minority in Poland, which was the largest in the country and also campaigned for equality of rights and autonomy and eventually turned against Poles uh, when their hands were untied when the state authority was absent. So I'm curious to why there were no more, no pogroms against Ukrainians. And the second question, again, you might only have time to address one, but I know in the book you find slightly different results for the Galicia part. In particular, your argument holds, but you also find an additional explanation. And so that additional explanation was very fascinating to me. It's so maybe you can address it. OK. Uh, Lots to, no, there was another question. I didn't. Sorry. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, right. Because yeah. um, uh, as someone brought up in Poland, I have not heard about programs until Yedwabna came up. So, um, but also I haven't heard about um, Ukrainians uh, massacres on Poles, uh, 43, 44, yeah. also in Kresy. So, I, what I find really distressing is the idea of Kresy and what the neighbor was uh, killing other neighbors not only uh, Jews, but also Poles and maybe Ukrainians in other, other, uh, other, in other places. Uh, do, you, like, do you also, while, while writing the book, were you also considering this type of, you know, uh, as a variable that would uh, explain? Which variable? I mean, like, uh, Kresy and what the history of Kresy and neighbors, Ukrainians, Poles and Jews, and uh, yeah, because it, it didn't stop there. I think. 
still 43, 44. Okay. <clears throat> so I have a short question about the role of the Catholic Church yeah. in Yedwabne versus other places. Did you take that as a variable? Yes. Um, I was wondering, in light of the points raised by both commentators, I'm wondering how much you looked at the pogroms against Jews that occurred after the war. Right. That is, those in those cases, you know, the presence of Germans and other factors wouldn't be an impediment to understanding. So, um, and particularly given that the vast majority of Jews by that point had already been killed, understanding the motives for the post-1945 pogroms would seem to be it. That gives you guys a lot to respond to. Okay, I'm obviously not everything. And yeah. I wanted to say one thing at the front end, though. I think after two books and 45 articles on Eastern Europe, and the fact that I grew up speaking Russian and I speak German and I read Polish for this book, I think I'm entitled to be called an, an area study specialist. I think let's, we'll, we'll have just like a, a truce on that, on that question. But let me go to the, like a few of the um, um, uh, points that were brought up. Laya brought up some very important points. I just want to hit, hit on one. Right? And that goes to this question of motive. And this is actually something that it, Jason and I had many discussions about this, the questions of motives. On the one hand, our study, like yours for that matter, can be read as an exercise in microstructuralism. That is to say, there are many motives going on. The question is, what is the communal context that allows these motives to be acted upon? When you look at the pogroms, you see, you see sexual violence, you see greed, you see politics, you see all the whole mess of human subjectivity out there, right? But that mess exists everywhere, but it only can be acted upon in some places. That's one way of reading our book as a kind of a comparative microstructuralism. A second way, however, is one that Jason touched on. This is one we didn't always agree, actually, and that is that when the conditions were right, the thing that actually drove Poles over the brink was previous, um, the previous political constellation of the place. And that where, where you have, there you do have a kind of a, a motive, um, which isn't to say these other things aren't going on, right? So, and we, we would agree with you completely. The Germans, very important. The, the, um, um, there, there are no pogroms without, without the German presence, right? There is no pogroms without the Soviet presence for things that you, for the reasons that you talked about, we talked about, and Jeff Hurd talked about, it, right? And th those are all true. I'll leave Jason to talk about the, 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 the other points. Um, let me just turn very briefly to um, Jeff's points. Can you separate the acts of the Germans? And you, you brought this up as well, Lana. Can you separate the, the massacres that go on? The timing of it, um, and this is you know, our reading, the timing of the, 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 this pogrom interlude happens between June 22nd, 1941, and it pretty much peters out by the time, because the next periodize, a proper periodization, right, is either ghettoization or mass massacres. The big shooting pit massacres do not happen during this period. There are some, but for the most part, they don't happen that way. And for that reason, we can separate. And I think what that allows us to do is something that's very important for political science. And that allows us to compare the Holocaust, or at least part of the Holocaust, with other instances. And that's something which has, I think, been absent for a long time. And this is something that historians may not know, but all political scientists do. There's a weird thing about political science. It hardly ever studies the Holocaust. The first panel in the history of the American Political Science Association on the Holocaust took place in 2011. And do you know how I know that? Jason and I organized it. Right? Now, you compare that with the AHA, which I've been to. Right? It's, it's very different, even though both associations look equally like a bar mitzvah. Right? <laughs> there are, um, it, it's, it's, so that's, it, it's so, and I think there's a whole sociology of knowledge here why Jewish political scientists chose not to study this. And it's another interesting kind of question. Um, but I think what this allows us to do is then to reintegrate what is the index case of violence in the modern world back more securely and joining others. We're not the only ones to have done this. 
um, back into the corpus of knowledge of political science. And that's why we do compare it with, we make it at least a very modest attempt to compare it with uh, other instances. Um, I should leave Jason some time to speak. Uh, there's a lot of, I, and you know, um, let me just say back to Volha's point. Um, I think that the, uh, the first point, why, why were the um, Ukra Polish-Ukrainian uh, violence, which happens in 43, um, that is, I believe, largely because of what the Germans were trying to do. There's no doubt the Germans, when they get in there, are trying to do pogroms. It's not just for the reasons that, that Jeff Bird said. It's also because we know this because of the similarity of the pogrom rituals. There was, there was a, an amazing similarity of pogrom rituals across villages. Not, ident, not identical, it was too chaotic for that, but there's some similarity. Later on, when the Germans, when the Germans um, are neither unwilling or unable to prevent Ukrainians and Poles from going at it, they do, right? And so I think you're right. I think you're right. It is a weakness of the book. We admit as such, right? Um, I can't remember. And you point to as such in your review of the book in perspectives, and it's an important. It's an important weakness. So, Jason, please. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, just a, uh, uh, a few points. Uh, uh, just one uh, footnote to the last comment uh, to Volha, which is that, uh, you know, in Galicia, Poles were a minority. Uh, and in this case, there were many more Ukrainians, you know, outside of the big cities, there were many, many more Ukrainians than Poles. And so just from a violence perspective, it was much harder for Poles to commit po pogroms against Ukrainians when the there were lots of Ukrainians around and would likely retaliate. Uh, so the Jews were a minority every, I mean, uh, you know, there was no place where they were sort of 90% and it would, would be therefore impossible. So just as a footnote uh, to like the incentives, uh, at least at that time. So uh, uh, getting to the periodization, I mean, uh, you know, our view is you can, first of all, you can separate out the violence. And so this is before the ghettos have, this is before the Germans know fully what they're going to do, uh, not just Vanze, but just in general. They don't have a full sense of what they're going to do. As Jeff said, uh, it's prior to ghettoization uh, also. Uh, the Germans are pushing to Moscow. They do stop, and they leave uh, bands behind uh, to sort of administer. But the Germans are rushing through. Uh, and in this period, uh, as Jeff said, they're you know, not heavy on the ground. At this point in time, they're relatively light on the ground. Uh, that said, we don't ignore German violence as much as bracket German violence. So for us, if the German, like Bialystok, we say explicitly, uh, if the Germans are doing the killing, we don't even count it as part of something that we want to explain. Uh, it's not one of our pogroms. Uh, it's not one of our pogroms because uh, for us, uh, the way we're defining pogroms is uh, sort of civilian on civilian violence. And so, uh, so, so it's outside of our ken. Um, you know, was it a part of the Holocaust? Uh, you know, uh, this was one of, uh, you know, Jan's uh, questions, which we answered in an online, uh, in an online forum. We, you know, obviously this is controversial and, you know, you can make arguments both uh, ways. Uh, our view is that the balance of the evidence is that it's uh, not a, a part of the Holocaust in the sense, in the narrow sense of the following, in that narrow sense that if the Holocaust is the, effort to systematically eliminate all Jews. It's a, was a, a, as we say in the uh, a, a conclusion of the book, it was a Catholic effort with a small c. Uh, it's a Catholic effort. Catholic. Young, old, secular, religious, nat it just didn't matter. Uh, as you say, for the males, there was a pants test. Uh, that was it. They didn't ask you who you voted, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, the pogroms, uh, in our, uh, as we have argued, were not a systematic attempt to eliminate Jews. They were attempt to put Jews in their place. Let's call it that. Uh, uh, they they were uh, relatively rare uh, based on what we would expect, uh, uh, and therefore are the. In our view, it's more uh, right to call them the last instance of. I don't want to call it classical, but you know, pre-Holocaust. Uh, civilian on civilian anti-Jewish funds. So the point here is that it's civilian on civilian anti-Jewish funds. The German presence, uh, 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 the German war was necessary, but the German presence was not necessary for, for a pogrom. They were not in Kielce, 
and they were not around for all the pogroms that occurred in the interwar period in the territory of Poland, including in some of the places uh, that had pogroms in 1941. And so it's just not the case that uh, you have to have the Germans there. And I realize this is a difference between political scientists and historians. Uh, uh, you know, for us, uh, uh, you know, we don't like to read back from the future, you know, uh, you know, back to, in, you know, let me give you a, an anecdote uh, about why it's uh, dangerous. And I'm sure you know this already for the purpose of the, uh, uh, of the audience. There is an anecdote in the book in which Jewish women, I believe, approach the Germans. That's yeah, shoot you. Approach the Germans for help against the Polish program. Now, why would they do that? Well, there's a very good reason. Because the Germans were the peacekeepers uh, in their last memory, which was World War I. Who were the same, who were the civil, who was the civilized force, uh, uh, quote unquote, I'm in quotes, uh, uh, that would have been the Germans in terms of, uh, you know, protecting this brutal, you know, keeping the, keeping the distinction between wartime violence and, you know, the laws of war and, uh, you know, civilian violence. That's why there were no pogroms in the German areas, because the Germans wouldn't allow any violence that wasn't their own, basically. They wanted to control, uh, they wanted to do the violence, and they didn't want civilians, uh, uh, they didn't want civilians doing it. But that's why you need to control for German presence, because where they are present, they No, no, but not, not in our, so, so, you know, the, uh, the quote, uh, the Germans were encouraging pogroms, not just because of Bialystok, which was a German action, not just because that killing uh, made its rounds, as Jeff, you say. Uh, it's like everybody learned, well, the Germans killed all these Jews. Maybe it's okay for us, uh, in other words. Uh, that's probably true. You know, I don't disagree with that. But there was also the order. I mean, the Germans were trying to encourage people. Uh, uh, to do it. And the fact is, they didn't do it. The people didn't do it. Or they didn't do it in proportions that you might imagine they would had they been given the opportunity. Just last point back to Jeff. Why did we not use the pogroms in Miasta Smerci, mm -hmm. right? Which you point out, it's a good, it's a good book. The, 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 in that book, he uses um, post-war Polish police investigations. Mm -hmm. And it's controversial enough that we only used the narratives from the investigations where we had other Jewish proof or, or, or Einsatzgruppen Berichte proof that the pogroms existed. Because we didn't want to get, I mean, it may be, and I think it's undoubtedly the case, people will find more pogroms. And, we're, and more people may not ever find the pogroms. I mean, if the, if the Germans came into a village and killed everybody, there's no evidence. There will never be evidence of a pogrom, right? We'll never find it. So I assume our list, which we do say at the back, and yes, I've found other mistakes too. Of course there are mistakes. Um, that it will be added to over time. But this gives people, we, with one of the benefits of the book, we have at the very back a kind of a the list of the pogroms um, and the sources sometimes, and where we can, more than one source. And then people will build on that. I mean, that's the idea. That's science over time. I mean, scholarship over time. Um, that's what we're trying to do. Yes, I think that's a good note to end on. And one, one thing I just want to say is we, nobody's mentioned the title, Intimate Violence, which really, that's what, that's what this book is about, civilian on civilian violence. Right. And, you know, that's really the, the sort of heart of it. And you've identified this as a topic that, you know, certainly relates to the Holocaust, but this, yeah. you know, I think that's an important point worth making. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you to the authors. Thank you. Thank you for